Dave was, had been mayor of uh, Hood River and had been on the city council and always had a kind of a natural in, interest in politics. And at that time, this area was being uh, represented by a man and wife team from uh, the Dalles. And uh, I thought that uh, it was kind of wrong for the two members of one family to represent the whole district. And I thought the district should be represented by uh, two, two families. <laughs> and so I decided to run against uh, his wife, Kitty Musa. Ben, ben Musa was in the Senate. And uh, I won that battle. And two years later, I announced that I was going to run for the Senate against Ben. And uh, for some reason or other, he had thought maybe I might have a chance to beat him too. So he didn't run. And wh when I ran for the Senate the first time, uh, no Democrat had filed against me. So I had a very easy uh, race of it. My wife, uh, was all for it, so I filed, and here I started my career. But uh, I liked it. I, it fit in pretty well with the business I was in at that time, and uh, I had the time to get devote to it. I, I liked people, and, and thought I was doing a pretty decent job of it, so I kept running, and luckily I kept winning. Let's see. I worked. Uh, pretty hard on the land use planning bill, Senate Bill 100, which has, I think, done a pretty good job for the state of Oregon. I also sponsored and got passed a bill that would allow districts to be formed across state lines. I had no idea. I was not the primary sponsor on that bill, but I do remember it. and. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, the corporation Guide Dogs for the Blind out in East Multnomah County had a copy of that bill <laughs> framed and on the wall when, when I was there and they called my attention to the fact that uh, I was a one of the sponsors on, on Guide Dogs. And that made me feel pretty good. Driscoll feels pretty good about it too. And the main sponsor of it thought that uh, it would work a little better if he had Democrats and Republicans. And of course, it, the uh, subject of that bill just makes, makes common sense. And it is kind of nice. And there isn't a fancy hotel or a fancy restaurant or a fancy anything, but what has to admit a guide dog in the United States. And uh, I have been the beneficiary of that situation a time or two too. Agriculture was real big. Um, transportation is, was also uh, very big for this area. I, at one time I represented uh, seven counties here in, the, in this area. All of five, uh, all of six I think it was, and, and uh, part of another one. If, if you're in the uh, metropolitan area, you could walk across your, your district in maybe a half hour. And uh, it took me two and a half hours to drive from one corner of my district to the other. It, it extended from real close to Hermiston, Oregon, and went down within about 50 miles of Eugene. And so, uh, if you were a rural legislator, you sure had to do a lot of traveling in the interim, especially when you had an election year. During that interim, there'd been quite a bit of work done on the water districts in the state and the irrigation districts, just cleaning up the bills and putting them in the right place in the ORS and so forth. And when they came back and were presented to the legislature, they went to two separate, uh, two separate committees. And uh, it just happened that uh, they hit the floor at the same time. 
and I was going to be carrying the bill regarding the uh, water district and somebody else had carried the bill for the irrigation district just prior to the uh, announced that I was going to carry this bill on the water district. And I looked at my notes and he had given all the points that I was going to give for the water district. So I just said, ditto. And uh, everybody kind of looked at me and looked at the bill and saw what I meant and it passed. So that was a very easy bill to carry. And it's the shortest one in the history of the legislature. Um, Fadley was president of the Senate and he was having uh, trouble getting a bill through that he was very interested in. And I knew that the, the uh, body was kind of split on how they felt about this bill. We used to take turns uh, giving the prayer members of the Senate and sometimes senator uh, ministers from that area and so forth. But I had been asked to that morning and I said, uh, I said uh, dear Lord, help and, and that was my prayer and it kind of made Fadley who was president of the Senate a little mad at me but uh, I thought it was effective prayer for the time. Believe it or not I was a senior in college at Linfield in the student body meeting and um, I had never been up in an airplane a senior in college. How many people would say that now? Um, one day a fellow got up and, and made the following motion. He said, seeing as how this is supposed to be a Christian institution, I make a motion that the student body go on record as being opposed to the administration placing any form of advertising for the military on the bulletin board. Well, it didn't even come to a vote. We kind of hooted it down. We all knew that that fellow was a communist, and right now he'd probably be a conservative Democrat. But but I got wondering what uh, what was he what pulled his tail on that subject. So I went to the bulletin board and looked, and it says be a naval aviator. Well, I was a senior. I was getting a degree in business administration. I didn't have any job lined up. And I started looking at the qualifications that were necessary to, to, uh, to enter the Navy pilot program at that time. And I, I thought I fitted in pretty well as far as height and weight and college degree and so forth. If I'd only had two years of college, uh, subjects would have had to been in chemistry and physics and things like that, which I did not have. But anyway, I talked to my roommate about it and he kind of got interested too. And the two of us applied and lo and behold, both of us made it. We both, each got our, our Navy wings because of, uh, he, he, he was in the Navy and I ended up in the, the Marine Air Corps. I believe it was in about June of 1941, uh, they were recruiting for an outfit called the American Volunteer Group out in China. And uh, I thought about it quite a bit and uh, I had made up my mind I didn't want to have a military career and I thought, and I hadn't traveled very much. And, and uh, two or three of us, good friends, in the, that same squadron, I, I think three guys will do something that one wouldn't do. And we started talking and said, well, let's look into that. My pay jumped about, uh, they offered me three times as much pay as I was making for a second lieutenant. Uh, the fact I'd get to travel quite a bit, the fact that uh, I could end my military uh, duties, uh, formal military duties anyway, uh, and go into test flying or other things when I came back if I wanted to. Um, and I actually did have a kind of, I felt very sorry for the Chinese at that time because they were really taking a beating. And uh, I also thought maybe I could do a little 
good for the Chinese people. So there was quite a few reasons, and, and three guys talking themselves into it <laughs> was probably, and very, very good friends. Uh, and we all ended up in the same fighter squadron out in China. And, and um, one fella didn't go. There were four of us started in. And that one fella backed out because he was the son of a widowed lady, only son. And oddly enough, uh, he was killed in a routine cross-country flight while the three of us were waiting to take the ship out to China. And the three of us that went out there all came back. Yes, we were outnumbered. Sometimes uh, we might have 12 airplanes uh, taking on 100 of them. Um, and our main object would be the bombers, so there was no doubt about that. We had a plane in the P-40 that had an advantage, though, and we had orders from General Chenault to live to fly another day because, uh, in other words, don't take too many chances, but because we need the airplane and we need need you. But uh, the uh, fact that we could outdive the Japanese fighters uh, was a big advantage. If you start dogfighting with him and you, if he starts to get on your tail, all we had to do was put the nose of that P-40 down and, and we could dive out and he couldn't stay with us. So we had that advantage. We also had um, more firepower in the P-40 than the Japanese fighters had in their airplanes. Most of our, our actual targets, though, were the bombers. The Japanese were good pilots and flew good formation, but uh, if you pick away at them, uh, you get pretty good results, especially when you could call the shot as far as you're, whether you're going to continue the fight or not. But it was a wonderful experience as it worked out. Uh, we, we made a pretty good name for ourselves while we were there. Madame Chiang Kai-shek came to this country while we, I was testing at Republic. And there were about, I would say, 10, eight or 10 of the AVG pilots working on Long Island, either at Grumman Aviation, where they were building Navy planes, and the Republic, or Pan Am offices were there. There were a couple of Pratt and Whitney uh, had some AVG pilots there. But anyway, she spoke from Madison Square Garden over national radio. And somebody got the idea that they should have some of us come in and be her guard of honor and when she walked onto the stage. Well, so we were there that night and there were, every, there were eight governors there from the East Coast. Uh, Wendell Wilkie was there, the British ambassador was there and uh, we were standing around in the group and Hap Arnold, who was then commanding general of the United States Air Corps, uh, came up and, and saw us. And, and we had our uniforms on that uh, we had used out in China and, and a, a good percentage of, of the group had been army, but uh, he, he recognized the uniforms and he came up and I was out side circle and, and he started talking to me and he says, say, young man, when am I going to get you fellas back? And uh, I kind of grinned and I said, well, in the first place, General, you didn't have me. And in the second place, you're not going to get me. And he gave me a quick look and, and um, said, well, what are you doing? And he, I said, well, I'm an experimental test pilot on the P-47 out of Republic. And he, patted me on the back and said, you're doing your part. And then he started visiting with me a little bit. And he said, you fellas should be proud of your record out there. You did a good job. But I hope you understand that your main contribution to your country wasn't the number of airplanes that you happened to shoot down. And you did a good job there. But you carried the morale of your country for six months because here was a small group of American pilots flying American-made airplanes, putting on a good show. And it was the only place 
for six months if there was anything good coming. And it took us six or eight months to get going. And you carried the morale of your country for that time. And he said, that young man was your main contribution. It wasn't the fact that you shot down a lot of airplanes. Well, as I said, uh, I was a test pilot at Republic and Grumman Aviation, which was the manufacturer of, of many, many uh, airplanes like the Wildcat and the Hellcat and so forth. Uh, we traded flights once in a while. They, they were interested in our opinions of their airplanes, so they'd invite us to come over and fly uh, anything new that they developed. And uh, I had flown the Wildcat while I was in the Marines. Uh, and here's a little offshoot of that. I, I checked out in two different airplanes on two different carriers and had a grand total of 17 carrier landings before I, I left the Marines. And when the Hellcat came out, uh, they were interested in what we thought of it. And I was down in the john and washing my hands. And I looked up and was conscious of a tall gut fellow standing beside me and I looked up and it was Lindbergh. And he quickly said to me, say, would you tell me what kind of insignia that is on your flight jacket? I, I don't recognize it. And I said, well, I had been with the Flying Tigers out in, in China and Burma, and uh, that's the, the insignia for the third squadron, the Hell's Angel. And he says, hey, that was a pretty famous outfit. And, and just then the fellow I had gone over there with to fly the Hellcat, burst into the john and he says, hey, Journey, well, Lindy's around here someplace. And I said, yeah, I right here. And looked up at him and he was a, kind of a short guy and he stuck out his hand and shook it and Lindbergh grinned and pretty soon he said, have you fellas had a chance to look at a Corsair? And we both hadn't and said so. And so he said, well, come out. And he says, I'll, I'll show you the one I flew in here. And of course, that was, uh, we were interested in anything different. And so we went out and we had a, about a 20 minute uh, dissertation uh, from him on the features of the Corsair, which was a good Navy fighter. And, and pretty soon they announced that uh, um, the plane that we were ready to fly was ready. I was scheduled to fly at first. But I knew Lindbergh <laughs> wanted to get out of there. And so I started insisting that he fly at first. I, I said to him, look, Lindy, when I get through here, all I have to do is drive about 10 miles and go home. My day's work's going to be through. You flew in here. I know you're going to fly out someplace. And I, it would seem to me that you'd like to get going. He said, well, I'll tell you the truth, I would. <laughs> and OK, I said, fly it. And then so. He got in that Hellcat, and when he got ready to land about a half hour later, he couldn't get the gear down. And he, after, I tell you, that every engineer in that Grumman factory was out there because he hears Lindbergh in one of their airplanes and the gear wasn't coming down. So finally, after three dives and a quick pullout, he flipped the gear down and he, he landed it and, and uh, I had the nerve to come up to him and I said to him thanks for checking that thing out for me Lindy <laughs> he laughed and uh, about a month later he came to Republic to look at our latest P-47 and I, he recognized me and we had another visit so I uh, always kind of like to tell that tale because I consider him to be one of the greatest pilots of all time. Pilots got the Distinguished Flying Cross and all the crew members, the, the prop men and the mechanics and the radio men and so forth, received the Bronze Star. We only got one, but uh, it, it felt pretty good. But here, here again, I, it's kind of interesting. I, I'll bet you that I'm the only man 
in the history of the world, and probably will be, that received the DFC over 50 years after the fact with a guide dog. Well, I think sooner or later, uh, they will have to go to yearly sessions. I, I think that's down, down the line. Remember who Al Ullman was? He was a representative from this area, lived out, out near Baker or someplace, and, and he was uh, uh, representative for quite a while at Washington, D.C. But I remember going back to Washington, D.C. one time when I was back there on some uh, Coca-Cola thing or Soft Drink Ballers Association thing or anything, and we were supposed to look up our, uh, invite our representatives to a social function that evening, and, and I contacted uh, Ullman, and sure enough, he came. Well, it was right kind of at the beginning of my senatorial career, and, and we hadn't met each other and uh, before, and we kind of went to one side and started getting acquainted, and, and, and pretty soon, he, Al Ullman said to me, uh, what are you guys going to do about Oregon's tax situation? And I kind of grinned. I said, well, I don't know just what we can do. I know that a few of us Republicans think we ought to have a sales tax to take some of the load off the property tax. And Al Ullman quickly said, Oregon has to come to a sales tax. And I looked at him. I said, I can quote you on that, can I, Congressman? And he grinned and he says, if you do, I'll deny I ever said it. <laughs> and, but uh, I still, I still, I think that any state that uses all three forms of taxation, pr property, sales, and, and income tax, and it's, of course, you can have out of balance in that, but even if you have all three, you're better off than having two or one, and uh, it spreads the load properly, and uh, I think that, uh, that, I still think that Oregon needs a sales tax, general sales tax. What I'm about to say would maybe answer some of the things that are, are wrong down there right now, because if, if I were starting out all over again, I would uh, be interested in, uh, and I was uh, interested in city government, school boards, uh, and so forth, uh, and county government, and run for those offices and see whether you like it or not and see if you do a good job. But start out um, in, in uh, the local areas before you start uh, running for the legislature. Now, I'm not saying that a person couldn't do a good job and there are good legislators that never had any experience in, in uh, local government, but uh, you find yourself representing a, a lot of cities. I, I can't remember, I think I had 38 city councils that I uh, had to answer to as a member of the Senate, and uh, Lord knows how many school districts and so forth, but if you've had a little experience, before you get there, you understand those problems a little better. Well, one, th one thing I I'd like to say is that um, my wife, Jen, when you met, uh, I probably w would never have run for the legislature if it hadn't been for her. Uh, she was got behind me and was, worked on my campaigns and, and did, did a lot of footwork and, of course, uh, we were both quite a bit younger in those days, and, and she was my uh, secretary for s several sessions. Um, she had the training to be a secretary, so that fit in pretty well. Uh, and I, I owe a lot of my political success to Jen Jernstead. And uh, I haven't told her that often enough, I guess, I'm sure, but uh, I'd like to make note of it because she has been a very, very helpful person.